All right, so you wanna get started in FPV. You wanna fly in a simulator or maybe buy your first drone. And you've decided that maybe you should get your first controller. And these are also known as a radio transmitter or sometimes referred to as just a radio or just a transmitter. Anyways, you wanna get one and you start looking at the internet and all of a sudden you are overwhelmed with options because there are a lot of these to choose from. And if you were to currently ask me which radio I'd recommend, I'd probably give you guys a few different options as well, mostly depending on your budget. I'd say the Beta FPV Light Radio SE for someone on a really tight budget, the Radio Master TX12 on the lower end, or a TX16 or Tango 2 for a higher end setup. These are some of the best radios out there right now, and some of the best in their price range. But why? What actually makes them good? And what makes one radio worth $40, while this one is $260? And should you spend the money on one like this, if you can just get one like this instead? So that's what I wanna talk about today. Now, I just quickly wanna say that as many of you know, I'm still pretty new to the FPV scene and there are so many people way more knowledgeable about this stuff than I am. But being somebody who knows nothing about electrical circuits, engineering, or any of that technical stuff, I get how overwhelming it can be to learn all this. So my goal is to just share with you guys the things that I learn as I learn them in the way that I wish they were taught to me, just in the simplest way possible. So I hope you guys like this video. Anyways, what features should you really care about when choosing your first controller? Here's my take on FPV Radios 101. Let's get into it. First, the most obvious difference between all of these controllers are their sizes. And depending on the size of your hands and just your personal preference, a smaller or bigger controller may feel more comfortable. Of course, it may be hard to know what you prefer before you get to try a few controllers first, but it's still something to keep in mind and use your best judgment on. There are also two ways to hold your controller which could affect which one you prefer, and they are thumbing and pinching. Thumbing refers to the traditional way you would use a video game controller, where your thumbs are solely responsible for your stick movements. For someone who prefers to fly this way, a smaller controller may feel more familiar and ergonomic, but again, this will still vary from person to person. However, controlling an FPV drone is a bit more nuanced than playing video games, and it requires a lot of precise micro-movements with your sticks. So because of that, some people prefer pinching with their thumb and index finger instead, which can give a greater sense of control. For those who use this method, a controller that is too small might feel a little bit cramped and uncomfortable, so getting something bigger may be better suited. I fly using what I've heard most people call the hybrid method, which still involves mostly using my thumbs, but still placing my index fingers along the top for extra support. In my opinion, this is just the best of both worlds. I'll also add that smaller ones have the benefit of being easier to travel with, while bigger ones have the space for more features, which I'll get into a little bit later. Next, the quality of your sticks or gimbals can also make a big difference. And there are two main types, hull sensor and potentiometer. Although from the outside, they visually look the same, the difference between the two boils down to the method they use to detect and record the movements you make. Now, I've heard a lot of mixed opinions on which type of gimbals are more precise, but it seems like the accuracy of both can be pretty similar. The difference is that hull effect gimbals will maintain accuracy for a longer time while potentiometer gimbals tend to wear out over time. This results in hull effect gimbals usually costing a little bit more, but if it's within your budget, hull effect gimbals could end up saving you money in the long run. It's also good to note the size of your sticks as well. A cheaper radio may have smaller gimbals, which can be less accurate than a larger gimbal with more surface area, but which size you prefer can also be a personal preference between thumbers and pinchers. The next question you should ask is how many switches does my radio have? Some radios may have a ton of switches, knobs, and buttons on them, and others might have only a few. For other types of RC hobbies, having a ton of switches could be really useful, 
but for FPV drones specifically, you really don't need that many. Uh, common functions for a switch might be to arm or activate your drone, uh, turning on a buzzer to help you find it, maybe changing the flight mode from a more stabilized to fully manual mode, or activating turtle mode, which will flip your drone after you crash it upside down. I usually end up using three or four switches for most of my quads, but I don't know, you may want more. Now, something that you have to keep in mind is that every switch, button, or stick command that you decide to use on your radio has to be transmitted to your drone via a channel. Now, every radio will have a minimum of four channels, and all four of these are needed just for your stick commands. Any change to your throttle will be transmitted through one channel, yaw through another channel, roll using a third, and pitch using a fourth. However, you're going to want more channels to use other features as well. This radio needs four for its sticks, but it also has four switches. Luckily, this is an eight channel radio, so there's one channel for each. My bigger radios though are 16 channel radios, but some of them have more than 16 switches and buttons on them. So when I got those radios, one of the first things I had to do was assign a channel to every switch that I wanted to use. So it's important to keep in mind that although your radio might have an insane amount of options for buttons and switches, make sure that you have enough channels to actually use the ones that you want. For a beginner, eight should probably be enough, or you can look for one with more if you want more flexibility. Now, the main point of your radio transmitter is to communicate with your drone. And it does that via the tiny radio receiver that you put into that drone. The thing is, not all receivers can communicate with every radio. So you have to make sure that you choose a receiver that can communicate with the radio that you want. This is why when you're purchasing most pre-built FPV drones, you'll get a list of receivers that you can choose from. A few of the examples that I see the most are the XM Plus, uh, the RXSR, FlySky, and Crossfire receivers. The reason these are the ones commonly available is because they correspond with some of the most popular radios that people are using right now. A lot of times, the transmitter and the receiver that can communicate with each other will be made by the same company. For example, the XM Plus and RXSR receivers are made by FR Sky and will work with FR Sky radios. FlySky receivers will work with FlySky radios and TBS Crossfire receivers require a TBS radio or a TBS Crossfire module. But this isn't always the case, so it's important to check what receiver protocols your radio can understand. The good news is that recently there have been a lot of radios released that have multi-protocol support and can be used with a variety of different receivers, not just one. This still doesn't mean that they'll work with just any receiver, but you do get a lot of options. It's also important to know that not all receivers are equal. Some may be better or worse, come in different sizes, and may have varying features. Going into that would be too much for this video, but it is something to keep in mind. Luckily, when buying a pre-built drone from most of the main retailers, all the options that are given to you will be adequate. My personal advice though would be to choose a radio and a receiver combo that is popular and widely available. Because first of all, it's already hard enough to troubleshoot FPV equipment. Uh, at least if you have a popular product, the increased amount of videos and other resources that you'll have available to you will make the whole learning and troubleshooting process just so much easier. If it's within your budget, getting a radio that supports multiple receiver protocols can also make things easier for you as well. So that's also something I would recommend. All the radios I have are compatible with FR Sky receivers. So my go-to was always the FR Sky RXSR uh, whenever it was an option. That is until I got Crossfire. Let's talk about that. Now, there are a few things that can affect how far you'll be able to fly using your radio. But one major thing that it will depend on is the frequency that your controller is operating on. And before you start thinking, oh man, that seems complicated, it doesn't have to be. 
Just remember that 2.4 gigahertz is the standard for most radios these days. And all the ones I have operate on that. Also remember that the lower the frequency gets, the more range you'll most likely be able to get as well. Typically, one of these 2.4 gigahertz radios could get you around one kilometer of range without any obstructions. Maybe more, maybe less. I'm not totally sure on that. But if you wanna go further with a reliable signal, you will wanna invest in a long range system that runs on a lower frequency instead. The most recommended and popular option for that is TBS Crossfire. There's a radio called the TBS Tango 2, which already has Crossfire built in. Buy this radio and a receiver, and they claim that you'll be able to fly up to 30 kilometers away with your quad. You most likely won't be able to go anywhere close to that, but it does make a really, really big difference. Since most radios don't have Crossfire built in though, if you wanted to upgrade your radio, you will have to get an external Crossfire module, which looks like this. Therefore, the next question you might want to ask is... Again, since most controllers will not have a long range system built in, if that's something you're interested in, you might want to make sure that your controller has a module bay that can support it. If it does, all you have to do is pop the module on, change a few simple settings, and you're good to go. It's as simple as that. Also, my friend Skyball FPV, who helped me with this video, made a really good point saying that a module bay can help future-proof your radio as well. As long as you have a radio that has good, high-quality hardware that will last a long time, uh, even when new protocols are developed years from now, instead of tossing your old radio away and buying a new one, you may be able to use your same old radio and just pop on a new module with the newest cutting-edge technology. Once again, it's a pretty cheap investment that could save you more money in the long run. All right, to recap so far, a few of the main points you may wanna consider when buying your first controller are, how does it feel in your hands? What kind of sticks or gimbals does it have? How many switches or buttons does it have? Does it have enough channels for all the switches that you wanna use? What kind of receivers does it work with? And does it have a module bay? Now, for me as a beginner, those are the main things I would look for, but there are still a few other things you may wanna consider, so I'll go over those quickly. The first thing anyone should do when getting started in FPV is practice in a simulator. So it's nice when your controller is plug and play when you connect it to a computer. Uh, some cheaper controllers may require you to use extra software to map out all of its features or may not even have the option to be used with a computer at all. Different controllers may also run different software, which can give you more options for how you interact with your drone. The most common software is OpenTX, and most of the controllers here in my lineup, except for the Beta FPV one, use some variation of it. OpenTX is popular because it's filled with features and is highly programmable, allowing the user to set up very customized controls. To be honest, I hardly use any of the features that OpenTX offers, but again, due to its popularity, I do love how many resources are available for it online. Next is telemetry support. Although the main function of your controller is to send information to your drone, some receivers may be capable of sending some information back to you. For example, you may wanna know your signal strength, how much battery you have left, or your GPS location. You can get all of this information from your receiver, and this is called telemetry. It's also one of the main features you may look for in a receiver. Now, this isn't something you necessarily need in your controller, because most of the time this information will also be displayed in your goggles as well, but some people like to have it for audio warnings and other purposes. Different controllers may give you various options of output power, and selecting a higher output power is another way to give you more range. Depending on where you live though, uh, there may be restrictions on how high of a power output you can legally use. So make sure to do some research on drone laws for your country or region uh, to know what you can and can't legally do. The same goes for frequencies, which we talked about earlier. Finally, you may wanna pay attention to other features like the build quality, screen quality, and the size of your battery bay. Some controllers feel cheap, while others feel more premium. 
Some have simple screens while others are high resolution and have color. Also, the larger the battery bay on the controller, the bigger battery you can use and the longer you'll be able to use it without charging. Overall, I think spending a little bit more on your controller can give you significantly more value and will save you money over time. Uh, which features are most important to you though will depend on your particular needs and preferences. Once you finally choose your radio though, the last question you're gonna wanna answer is what configuration is best for me? When buying your radio, you will often get a choice of the configuration of your sticks. Uh, the most popular options being mode one and mode two. Basically, mode one has your throttle on the right and mode two has the throttle on the left. If you're not sure which one you prefer, I'd say just get mode two. It's the one that most people use. It's also relatively simple to change this later on, so you can always configure this by yourself if you change your mind. So that's it. Those are all the main features that most of you guys starting out will care about when choosing your first radio. But to quickly apply that to all the radios that I recommended, the light radio is very bare bones. It still almost has a toy grade quality and a bare minimum amount of features, but it's extremely cheap. It's only $40. Uh, it can connect to FR Sky receivers, which can be found everywhere and can be easily used with a simulator as well. It's pretty functional, but there's nothing great about it. The TX-12 is a little bit bigger, more comfortable to hold, has a screen, can be used with multiple different receivers, and has a module bay in the back. All this for still the relatively low price of $80. I'd say the main downsides of this radio are that it still has cheaper gimbals and a somewhat toy grade build quality. The TX-16S, which is my daily driver, is $170 for the version with Hull Effect gimbals. But it's packed with features, has a great build quality, great gimbals, a high quality screen, and is compatible with a ton of different receiver protocols. It can also be bundled with a Crossfire module for $260. Finally, the one radio that I don't own but recommend is the Tango 2 which is $160, has an equally high build quality to the TX-16S, but has a much more minimal design. Uh, what also makes the Tango 2 special is that it has Crossfire built into it. So it doesn't require any additional purchases if you wanna fly long range. The compromise it makes is that it only has Crossfire built into it. So if you wanna fly it with any drones that can't fit a Crossfire receiver, you'll have to purchase a module for it that will give you access to different protocols as well. Anyways, that's it for today, guys. I hope this guide makes buying your first controller at least a little bit easier for some of you. Uh, if you think I missed anything important, make sure to let me know in the comment section below. And as always, I appreciate every single one of you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.